sorry. I scared the guys on the front row. Huh? I'll talk directly into the mic. I'll put it down. Okay, if you have your phones, go ahead and pull out the Uversion app. Is that better, Ben? Is it better? Um, if you don't, if you brought your actual Bible, Romans chapter 9, verse 30 is where we're going to start. We're going to be camped out mostly in Romans 10 tonight. Um, just also wanted to give a quick thanks to Nicholas, especially when I throw it last minute at you, to put our stuff into you version tonight, and also to Ryan because I try to use really cool like typewriter fonts, and I forget he doesn't have the same font, and he fixes my mistakes and makes it look good. Um, so just thanks to the people behind the scenes that make things easier for us to study the Word of God together. Um, while you guys are turned to that passage, um, I want to open with a word of prayer real quick just to center my heart um, before we dive into the Word together. Father, I just praise you for your faithfulness. Um, God, I ask that you are pleased with our worship tonight. Um, and as you promised that when your word is spoken, that it wouldn't return void. Um, God, I thank you for um, the words of Paul um, in Romans and the truth that it speaks to our heart. God, I ask um, that it would cut us to the quick, um, that we would be responsive um, to hear. Um, and God, I just praise you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. So Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through the, all of chapter 10 is where we are tonight. Last week, Nathaniel spoke about God's sovereignty and his election, specifically in electing the people to service. Um, but it kind of sucks because it also talks about how not everyone um, is going to walk in God's grace. Um, there are some people, there are many people, unfortunately, that will choose not to do so. And so in Romans chapter 10, Paul lets up just a little bit, gives us a little bit more um, words of hope and encouragement, but at the same time, um, it's just very direct with the truth that many people will still choose not to walk in the full grace um, of God's salvation. But I also want to encourage you guys to remember as we're diving into God's word, the context of Romans, why it is that Paul wrote Romans in the first place and who his audience was. Um, he wrote to the church in Rome in large part to address the tension between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And his goal was to help them understand that they were all part of the collective church and they were all in need of his righteousness and his grace. And they were also all under the same obligation to share this message with others. They and we are responsible for what we do with the gospel. They and we are responsible for what we do with Jesus. So let's start in Romans chapter 9, verse 30, through chapter 10, verse 4. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And I've kind of titled the message tonight, Responsibility. And you're gonna kind of hear the theme of responsibility echoed um, throughout all of the sections of scripture that we are going to be reading tonight. But Paul's first thing that he talks about here is how the Gentiles have found what they were not looking for. Meanwhile, the Jews have missed what they were waiting for. And that just really resonates with my heart because the Jews had been waiting for this. They've been hearing about it. They've been receiving prophecy about it forever. And when it finally was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, they completely missed it because they were focused on the wrong part. They were focused on the law being fulfilled in themselves and not being fulfilled in the person of Christ. And then you have the Gentiles who weren't even looking for it, who weren't even waiting for it, just kind of stumbled upon this and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and it sounds good, and it sounds beautiful, and they are far more responsive than those who should have been the most responsive. The Gentiles were unconcerned about acquiring righteousness and getting the prize, and wandered into his grace, while the Israelites, in all their training and focus, missed it entirely as a whole. And a quote that you'll see up here, the Gentiles sunk in carelessness and sin, have attained the favor of God, while the Jews, to whom religion was a business, have utterly failed. 
And there's, it's kind of interesting how God works in different things. Um, I had talked to Sam, um, an intern from last year, a little bit about what I was going to talk about, but not a much. I think I just said, like, yeah, pray for me. I'm going to be speaking on Romans 10. And she texts me a screenshot of something she was um, reading for class, and it was just so perfect. I said, oh, it's so cool how God shares that with you to share with me, and I'm going to share it with you tonight because it was just so beautiful. It says, salvation is Christ. Grace is Christ. And guys, if we miss Christ or we reject Christ, it is true then that we miss grace and salvation, that we reject grace and salvation. And there's a commentary that I read, and it says, Israel has failed to enjoy the blessings of the messianic salvation because she has been preoccupied with the righteousness based on the law. Gentiles, on the other hand, are streaming into the kingdom because they have embraced a righteousness based on faith. But I love, too, that it bothers Paul that this is the case. It bothers Paul that his Jewish brothers are missing on God's righteousness because of their zeal for righteousness that can never be fully realized through the law. They were confusing where their emphasis needed to lie. Israel was defiant in their own self-righteousness. And I love to, and I bet that Paul was very reminiscent when writing this because he talks about how I bear witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to the knowledge. See, Paul too, when he was called Saul, was once zealous for scripture, for righteousness, for the law, but in all the wrong ways. And so I love that as he re writes this, I can just imagine the grief in his heart thinking about all of his fellow countrymen they were on the same path that he used to be on, and now that he walked in the fullness of God's grace, a complete transformed identity, he grieved that so many of his Jewish brothers had no idea. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, verse 5 through 13. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I love that Paul shows us here the message of salvation has arrived in completeness. And it is for everyone. It's not just for the Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews. It is for everyone. And it is God's desire that everyone is reconciled to himself. And I also love that Paul was very familiar with his audience and knew that they would understand that when he's talking about ascending to the heavens or to the abyss, that they would also be really familiar with Greek and Roman mythology and with the concept of going to Zeus for wisdom or Zeus coming to us to give us wisdom or going to Hades to get this insight and the instruction. He's saying none of that is necessary because Jesus has come to us to give us the story of redemption and grace and salvation. There's a quote, um, Jacqueline was sharing with me a book that she was reading, and I was like, oh, again, that's so cool, and it fits exactly in with it. Um, and it says, but the secret of the law was not to prove our inadequacy for God's sake. It was to prove our inadequacy for our sake. It was to help us understand that we could never match up to the measure that was demanded, that only Christ could be this. See, there's not only that the salvation message is for everyone, but there's also responsibility of the seeker. And so, so Paul points here and he says, they've heard, but it's what you do with what you hear that matters. Are you going to choose to walk from that and ignore it? Or are you going to choose to submit to what God has given you? See, he calls us to radical submission. And that's a word that doesn't sit well in our mouth often. But he wants us to lay down our own ideals and respond to what he's calling us to. It's so liberating and it's so freeing. But then, why the law? Why does the law even still matter? See, the law ends for the believer in the sense that our obedience to the law is no longer the basis of our relationship with God. But the law has not come to an end in the sense of no longer reflecting God's standard, 
or no longer showing us the need for a savior. See, the law still has benefit. It still shows us that God has a standard of living. It's not like, hey, I'm a Christian and I get this jail, get out of jail free card. I'm going to continue on my merry way and do as I please. God wants his children to reflect him and to live in a way that's pleasing to him. But he also knows that it is impossible for us to do that without the grace of his son, the example of his son, and that forgiveness when we will fail. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 21. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Little caveat here. They have not all obeyed the gospel. What is the gospel command? That we respond and that we also share the message that we have been given. They have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. And again, knowing that he would have a Jewish audience that would be reading his words, Paul quotes from three different parts of the Old Testament, saying, what I am telling you has been confirmed, not just in the prophets, not just in the wisdom or poetry writings, and not just in history or the law. It has been confirmed in all of those places. What I'm telling you is truth. The message of salvation has arrived in completeness for everyone. There is also responsibility of the seeker to submit and to share the gospel. And the role of the believer, I want to share with you what Paul says here. The role of the believer is to confess. And I love this description of these two different kinds of confession. See, when we confess our sin, it means to say the same thing about sin as God does. And when we confess about God, it means to say the same thing about God that other believers do. And I also want to show with you, or share with you tonight that baptism is also part of this confession before man as a public proclamation that you are a new creation. You have died to self and you are raised, submitted to Christ to walk in newness of life. It's a part of that confession. It's a part of that submission of following Jesus' example, becoming one with him, just like Paul when he, or Saul when he became Paul, changing his identity into a new person. So we confess him, but we confess him, Jesus, as Lord. And this is something that kind of blew my gasket a little bit when I was reading it. Um, It's proclaiming something that is true, whether or not a single soul believes it and builds their lives on it. It remains true, no matter what your response is. But also this, because for a Gentile to call Jesus Lord, it is indicative of a shift in loyalty and worship, because that was a title that was used for the emperor. So when they call Jesus Lord, they're saying, the emperor is not my Lord, Jesus is my Lord. And for the Jew, for someone to call Christ Lord is to say that they were God, to call him God. It would have been blasphemous in their culture to call him Lord if they did not believe in him and they hadn't submitted to him. So calling him Lord is not just a generic thing. It is saying, you are in charge. You are my Lord. I submit to you and to you ultimately and only. So calling him Jesus as Lord and calling on the Lord. This is not simply the first step in the direction of establishing a relationship with him. It is the mark of a believer. Calling on the Lord is not something that's one and done and you never go back to again. He calls us to sit at his feet. I was reading a little bit earlier today about the story of Mary and Martha and how Jesus was chiding Martha, and I'm a natural Martha, okay? I have to really remind myself to pull a Mary and sit at Jesus' feet. And he's saying, she's doing the thing that matters most. He wants us to invest in a relationship with him, but he also calls us to proclaim his message, and this is where it gets tricky for a lot of us. Sure, I don't mind calling Jesus Lord, but sometimes it's hard for us to surrender those really uncomfortable areas in our life. And you know that my mantra all semester, and even into this semester, is embrace the awkward. And often proclaiming his message can be awkward and uncomfortable. Paul, in essence here, is reiterating the Great Commission in Mark 16 and in Matthew 28, Peter's recent words in Acts chapter 2, and also what Paul said earlier in Romans chapter 6, all of which are commanding a spreading of the hope that we have in Christ and a call to action, confession and submission through baptism and obedience. 
<clears throat> the Lord has offered something beautiful to his people Israel, but they wouldn't take it. And so God hoped that in offering it also to the Gentiles, it would stir some jealousy to them that would motivate them to receive his gift. But unfortunately to many of them, they rejected it still. Luke chapter 10, verse 16. Um, Nathaniel pointed this in the commentary he's um, writing about Romans as we study it together as a staff. And it says, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects him who sent me. See, a rejection of Christ is a rejection of God. He doesn't give us an option of choosing just part of him. It's all of him or it's none of him. And I challenge you, if you're looking for a place to camp out in scripture for a little while, do it in Luke chapter 10. It'll blow your mind, I promise. See, Paul's countrymen, the Israelites, the Jews, they could not say, well, we had no idea. We hadn't heard this. Yes, you have for many, 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 many years. You have heard the message. You have heard the gospel through prophecy. You've seen it fulfilled in Christ. You've heard it yet again. They were responsible for the message that they had heard and the final word of Jesus Christ. I want to share with you, and it's a little bit goofy, so bear with me for the analogy, but as I was reading and studying this, I thought about baseball. Where are my baseball fans? Woo! More importantly, where are my Cardinals fans? Woo! I'm with you. I'm with you. But I got to tell you, eight years ago, I had no idea about anything about baseball. I mean, my husband's an avid baseball fan, so I have grown to love it and know more about it because I love my husband, right? Loving the things that he loves. Um, but I remember going to my first game. I was in college, and it was like this freshman event. Rain it back in, guys, I promise. It's good, it's worth it. Um, I remember going to my first game, and I couldn't have told you the rules of the game or what was going on or about any of the players or any of their stats, although I'm sure there was many a Cardinals fan that could, even those that weren't at the game. I had no idea. I didn't really understand what was going on, but I really enjoyed being there and being a part of the action and being involved with what was going on. And I will say that after having been at that game, like there started to grow a fondness in me for the community and the camaraderie of being a Cardinals fan. And now we go and get autographs like all the time. I've, my kids have autograph books for players. It's kind of ridiculous. Come see the museum that is my basement someday. Um, it's actually pretty impressive. But anyway, so I didn't really know what I was going into, but I wore the colors. I, it was a red Awana shirt because I didn't own Cardinals anything. Now I do. My husband has made sure my closet is stocked and full with Cardinals gear, as are my kids. But I cheered for the cards, and I was excited to be a part of it. Now imagine if my first game was not just a Cardinals game, but like the Cardinals at the World Series. Like, someone's like, hey, I know you don't really know anything about baseball, but this is something I want you to be a part of. And I was like, you know what? That sounds amazing. I'll go. And going would be incredible. It would be an amazing experience, even if you really didn't know anything about it, just because of the excitement and the enthusiasm of everyone that is there. Now, where are my Cubs fans? <laughs> Morgan, I love you. So what kind of big deal happened for the Cubs recently? They won the World Series. <laughs> Round of applause. They'd waited for a little while for it, okay? <laughs> Hesitant applause. I know. But I bet you Cubs fans have been waiting for them to go to the World Series for how long? Hundreds of years. <laughs> Since before baseball existed, right? They had been waiting and they had been researching and studying about like this curse and like the players and like the stats and all of these things. But guys, the Israelites missing Christ would be like a Cubs fan missing the World Series when they finally made it. They had been waiting for so long, they've been looking for it and for them just to completely miss it because they were so focused on memorizing the stats. Guys, that's what happened with the people of Israel. And that's what happened with the Gentiles. It'd be like me knowing nothing about baseball, and someone's like, hey, here, this is kind of a big deal. Here's a World Series ticket. I'm like, that sounds awesome. That's cool. I'll go. But guys, I want to ask you, is this something that Christ is extending to you? And you're like, nah, I'm okay with my Netflix. What he's offering you is a big deal. And I got to tell you, in Romans chapter 10, no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, whether you don't have one, you have one that's a little bit stale and crunchy, or it is super thriving and passionate, we all have a role in this. Are you missing the World Series or Christ's righteousness that's only found in him? Have you responded? And if you have responded, are you calling him Lord? 
Maybe what you need to do is make the public confession. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to fully submit. And I got to tell you, sometimes when it comes to baptism, like, oh, it's a thing maybe I should do. But like, there's the whole like time, there's the whole like place thing. We've removed both obstacles for you tonight. We have reserved the baptistry at Green Tree at 830. We have four people that are ready to go into the waters of baptism tonight. And if you are on that fence or you're thinking about it or you weren't thinking about it and you are now, I challenge you to pray about it. What's holding you back? What's preventing you from following Jesus' example? I mean, if Jesus did it, I think it's a pretty good call that we should do it too, right? He tells us that he wants us to follow his example. God wants us to mimic his son. This is a beautiful part of our relationship. So if you pray about it, you think about it, find us when we close in song at the end. Talk to Andy, Nathaniel, Mariah, myself. We'll get you there. We'll get it done. My towel's in the car. Okay? Sometimes we put it off, waiting for the right time or place. But I also want to ask you, not just have you received him, have you welcomed the gift of salvation that he's offering, have you called him Lord, but are you growing? See, we don't want to like just give it all to him and then do nothing with it. We need to grow. He needs to be Lord of our every day, of every nook and cranny of your life. Are you keeping areas back? Jesus, welcome into the home of my life. But don't go in those places. Like, they're kind of shady. How about you just stay in the living room? That's a cool place for you to be. Maybe don't even go to the refrigerator. Like, I got that too. Just ask and I'll give you something. He doesn't want to be a guest. He wants to live in fullness and completeness in your life. Are you willing to let him completely in or are you holding back? Because if you are, I got to tell you, you're missing out on something incredible and life-changing and eternally impacting. Are you proclaiming his message? And I know for a lot of you, this is the one that's really going to hit the nail on the head. And as the worship team comes up and we're about to spend some time worshiping Jesus together, meditating and contemplating and praying, I want to ask you, how will people call on the name of the Lord if they don't even know anything about him? How are they going to believe if they've never heard? And how are they going to hear if you, if you will not speak? See, we have a responsibility as believers as people who have received the beautiful gift of grace and salvation that is in Christ, that is Christ. And if we hold our tongue and we say and we speak nothing, guys, that's on us. And so I challenge you, if there is a person or a situation or a conversation in your mind that you know you need to have, do not wait. Call, text, set up a coffee date, or tell them, hey, I want to come over and like crash your place. I'm bringing Taco Bell. Let's talk Jesus. Whatever it is, do not put it off any further, because I got to tell you guys, life is short and it's unpredictable, and you never know. And I, I can't hit the embrace the awkward thing enough, because what the Holy Spirit asks us to do is usually so awkward and so uncomfortable. But I got to tell you, I have never regretted embracing the awkward and doing what the Holy Spirit calls me to do, even when it completely flops. And it is nothing like I anticipated, but I have always regretted telling the Holy Spirit, no thanks, maybe next time. So let's worship the Lord together. Let's search our heart for the areas that we need to say yes to our Lord, whether it's for the first time or really letting him in or saying, okay, I'll have those conversations with others. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the truth and the power of your word. Um, God, I ask that you would remove all obstacles and barriers that are holding us back um, from fully submitting to your kingdom. Um, God, I ask that your word would live alive in us, um, that we would have conversations that need to be had, that our pride wouldn't stand in the way, because God, our pride is so short and is just for a moment, but a relationship with you is for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.